Income tax 2023-2024. Income tax formula tax software example. Get ready and some coffee so we can avoid having to move into a shack from income tax 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Form 1040 example problem using LACERT tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to tax software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website irs.gov, irs.gov, simply searching for the form you're looking for, Form 1040 in this case. We're going to start off as we normally do with our taxpayer, Adam Taxman, who's just trying to avoid a dang taxman, or taxwoman for that case. The taxwoman can be even more ruthless than the taxman, I'll tell you what, these days. But in any case, now we want to take a look at the formula and compare the income tax formula to the income tax return and get an idea of how we might visualize the formula and then link it or apply it to the form as well as to the software. So remember our three tools that we're going to be using, which are all interconnected, which is what we want to focus in on this time, is the formula, which we will have in our head. And later on, we will, ex we will create an Excel worksheet for and then the forms, which we're looking at now as being constructed from the software, and then the software, which of course helps us to populate the forms, but also allows us to do that a whole lot easier to run different scenarios. So looking at the software, we can kind of see everything in one place at this point in time and get an idea of how these things are linked and how we might utilize these three kind of approaches to better uh, understand and then perform income tax preparation. So many softwares such as this have a tax summary tab, and this is basically a formula look at the income taxes. That's what it is to be a summary. And this is the kind of thing that we often have visualized in our mind precisely because it's going to be an easier thing to basically visualize. And you can see this basically looks like our, our income tax formula that we discussed here in a prior presentation. You've got your income, and then you have your deductions, which we can break out into the above the line or adjustments to income, and then the greater of either the standard or itemized deductions to get to the taxable income. This first bit basically being like an income statement, although a strange one. And then we're gonna apply the tax to get to the tax before credits and other taxes, and then we have other credits that we have credits that we can apply and other taxes. And then we have payments and we have this breakout between uh, refundable and non-refundable credits. So you can see that basically in a formula format here, we'll make a worksheet for this as well. Now you might say, well, why if LACERT has this nice, neat little summary or most tax softwares have this nice, neat summary, would we make an Excel worksheet? The Excel worksheet is usually for internal purposes, allowing us to recalculate what should be included in income, for example, adjustments and the deductions to recalculate the taxable income so that because we don't have a double entry accounting system to double check our numbers to reduce the likelihood of data input error and mistakes, we can basically input it two times and be able to visualize what is happening doing the calculations a bit more manually on the Excel side, allowing us a double check on, on at least this taxable income number. And then, if, and then we'll let the software oftentimes calculate the tax and then the credits on the bottom half of the formula and whatnot. Again, we can kind of try to mirror that on our end, although the credits and uh, the tax calculation, other taxes get confusing 
because there are often phase outs that will happen as income rises. So we'll have to parse those out one at a time. You don't need to memorize all of that stuff. The software will help you, but you have to have a conceptual understanding of it so that when you see these phase outs taking place, you're like, okay, I see what is happening conceptually and I can drill down on the details if I need to. Okay, so note that when we apply this formula to a, a tax return on the Form 1040, you might say, why is the Form 1040 as complex as it is? Meaning, if you were to build this tax return from scratch at this point in time, how would you do it? Well, if, if you've constructed like things in Excel, then you probably would say, well, I would have a, I would have a summary of, of the formula, meaning I would have something that looks basically like this income tax formula, and that would give me my summary numbers, and then I would use schedules to expand on each of these line items when necessary so that more complex taxpayers would simply be including more schedules, which isn't a problem these days, given the fact that we, we basically already have enough complexity, even with the basic tax returns, that you have to file these things basically electronically. So the number of forms isn't as much of a problem. However, the tax code has not been constructed from this day going forward. The tax code is a continuing work in progress and we can't just cut it and start scratch, right? Uh, we, have to, we have to keep on building on what has happened before. What has happened before is you can imagine the first income tax system was actually designed so it would only be relevant to like wealthy people, right? And then when, it, when they expanded the taxes, then, then they tried to make it simple for normal people to file the tax return. How do you do that before computers? You make it fit on one card. So it should be a very basic thing that you, that you populate. And, and then the tax code got more and more complex and impacts more and more people in some way, shape or form, even people that don't actually owe taxes because now it's part of the safety net program or welfare kind of program. So you still have to fill out the complicated tax return, even if you owe no taxes oftentimes these days. And the credits are also becoming somewhat complex. So what they did then is, is they went from like a form to having like a bunch of forms, like a 1040A, a 1040EZ, so that they could try to at least keep it on one form, even though the form was like at least two pages long at that point. Uh, and then they finally said, uh, and I think it was a smart move, that this is silly to have all these different forms when you don't need to go to the post office to fill out the tax return. You could do it online. So we could try to streamline it more so that we have a summary page like this, like you would kind of build in Excel, and then all of the other forms related to that summary page. And that's kind of what we have now, although not totally. So in other words, these schedules, schedule one, two, and three are relatively new, and they give more detail about some of these line items, which allows us to eliminate some of the confusion of having multiple different forms like a 1040A, a 1040EZ, e and that kind of stuff. Uh, so, but we haven't completely done that at this point in time. Uh, so you can see like, when I look at each of these categories on the form 1040, it still includes a lot of bloat, a lot of other stuff on the actual face of the form instead of being a summary. So when we visualize the, the forms, we're, we're usually visualizing in this format because this fits in our mind. And then if there's a, if there's a, if there's a question about income, we think, is it included in this line item? And what's going to be the rippling effect across the formula if it increases or decreases income? If there's an, an item that's going to be on this line item, an adjustment to income, then what's going to be the impact on the adjusted gross income? And what will be the rippling effect, effect from that, given the fact that many tr credits and stuff are, are linked to the adjusted gross income, right? If there's, an, if there's something that happens to the itemized deductions, then are we itemizing or standardizing or not? If it's a deduction line, I'm gonna visualize that line, see if it, if it impacts the tax return, see if it increases the itemized deductions over the standard deductions, for example, 
and then think about what that impact will have as it ripples through you know, the rest of, of uh, uh, the return. So that's the general idea. Now, if I look at each of these line items, let's look at this formula that we had over here. So income up top. So if I go under my tax form, the income is, th is in this line item. It's not just one line item because they included all this stuff. You've got the W-2 income, you've got the tips, you've, you've got the Medicare waiver, taxable dependent care, employer pro provided adoption, and so on and so forth. Interest, dividends, IRA distributions, pensions, social security, and so on. All of this stuff, you would think, why didn't they put that on another schedule? They kind of could, but you know they, they're just sticking to what they've had. They did include some of the stuff on another schedule. So if I go into the schedule one, you can see we have the additional income and adjustments. And so this then is kind of like how you might build it in Excel in a separate schedule, which will then feed in to the parent schedule. This is going to form 1040 line eight. So if I go back into the form 1040 line eight, then, then you're gonna see it would feed in to here. So that's how, so that's how the, so anything in this area, if I had W2 income, it's going to be populating here. If I have interest income, I'm going to visualize it happening on the income line item. And I'm going to say, okay, uh, interest income, let's say it was bank one was a thousand dollars. So I'm going to visualize it, you know, populating in income, but it's in its own line item in this ex expanded format of income. Do I have to include interest income is the question. If I do, that's bad for taxes, right? And so yeah, we have to include it in income. And that's going to be increasing my top line item. And then what's going to be the rippling effect of that across the rest of the of the of the tax return, including things like having the the uh, the the progressive tax rates and whatnot. If you had dividend income, similar thing, if I went to income and i say we had dividend income let's say we had a uh, dividend income of fifteen thousand, and let's say it was all qualified well then i'm going to say okay that pulls into again the income line also another schedule is now created which feeds in so because we had to include the schedule because now the iris wants more detail this is a sub schedule that like an Excel worksheet, a separate sheet that feeds into the summary sheet over here. And then it feeds into income. Then I have to think about the rippling effect of that because it also has an impact on my adjusted gross income, which is going to have an impact on phase out for deductions. The fact that it's qualified will also have an impact on my tax calculation, given that qualified dividends often have a different tax rate than ordinary income. So you see how I'm kind of thinking of it. I'm not thinking of it box by box in my mind. I'm thinking what's happening here, top lines being impacted income, and then what's the rippling effect of that as I think about the rest of the accounting equation. And then I can confirm that by actually running the scenarios in software and then looking at the impact on the actual tax forms to verify what I what I've been what I kind of thinking in my mind should be happening. And then I can double check that with a formula using Excel software. So then the adjustments to income, let's let's bring this back, I'm going to go back to just normal income. So let's get rid of this line, I'm going to delete that. And uh, you will be able to okay. And then I'm going to go to do. And so that's gone. And then let's go back to uh, interest and delete this one. To do it. Okay. And then if we had adjustments to income, then we're going to say, I see where that happens here in my formula, uh, in, in my tax return. So we've got we've got the adjustments to income line 10 that comes from schedule one. So this makes sense. So now because if I didn't have any adjustments to income, many basic tax returns will not, then I don't need a schedule one. So it'll be a simplified return. Due, due to the fact that I, I don't have like a, a, a 1040EZ, but instead I don't have to add subschedules to them because it's a simple return. If I do have to add them, then I'm gonna go to schedule one. This is page number two of schedule one. And then we have our adjustments. We'll go through each of these adjustments later. One of the major ones might be uh, contributing to an IRA 
for example. So if I was to go to the IRA and I jump to the IRA, let's say we have a maximum contribution, then that would feed into this subschedule. So then I'd be thinking in my mind from a formula standpoint, okay, that's gonna feed into the adjustments and above the line deduction in essence or adjustment to income in actuality in the software if i plug it in to confirm that yes it's in this schedule and then it sums up here and then it pulls into the form 1040 our income is all this stuff that gets down to my total income and then we have the adjustment to income to get me to the adjust to income if we look at that from a from a tax soft like a just a formula Income's at 100,000, and then we have our above the line deduction or adjustment to income to get us to our adjusted gross income. Then we think about the rippling effect that that will have on the rest of the tax return, including that it might uh, have an impact on the phase outs of credits and deductions, for example, as well as basically the tax rates, of course, because it's going to have an impact on taxable income and therefore the tax brackets that will be. Uh, involved in. All right, let's go back and take that one out. And so then, so then we have, uh, if I go back on up here, so we've got, then the next line is going to be the standard deduction or the itemized deduction. So the standard deduction is the one that everyone gets. And so if I look at the standard deduction, so I'm going to say, all right, if that's going to be uh, the, t the adjusted gross income. Here's the standard deduction. You've got this nice little table over here, which gives you the basics of the standard deduction, which are single 13, uh, 850 married, uh, filing joint, you double it, right, which makes sense, right? 13, 850 times two, if there's two people, you get a deduction of the 27,700 head of household, then it's kind of in between those two, we'll talk more about this later. And then you could have differences on uh, specific circumstances, which we'll talk about later, but that's going to be that line item. So if I see, for example, a change up top from status, single to married filing joint, or if there's a dependent and they were single, I might think that that could indicate that they could be head of household. My thought process is what's the impact that that's going to have on the standard deduction. And then again, how does that ripple through the rest of the return? It's basically a deduction. Therefore, it's going to decrease the taxable income, which will decrease the total tax that's going to be paid. It also might have an impact as to whether they're going to be taking an itemized deduction or not, because if the standard deduction goes up, if they get married, then it's less likely they're going to take a, an itemized deduction because the itemized deductions have to be higher than the standard deduction. And if we go into the, the, the itemized deductions, that's on a separate schedule. So you would only have this separate schedule if you had a more complex return. What are the things that usually push people into taking it? It would be the owning of a home, which I don't suggest you own a home simply to pay interest so that you can basically itemize. However, if you're thinking about owning a home, that's one of the things that could that could push you over the threshold because you have the uh, mortgage interest here possibly. And so we could say, and with the interest rates going up these days, it could be, you know, significant mortgage interest. I'm just going to make up a number. And then you could have taxes that you'll end up paying. And note that there's there could be a, a cap on the number of taxes that you can deduct personal residence, principal residence, let's put let's put 6000 for the taxes. And so now, if I look at that, that's gonna that's gonna sum up over here 22205. If I now that is relevant, if I jump back to the 1040, it's gonna pull over to the 1040. And now when I look at this standard deduction or itemized deductions, I'm pulling in 22205 the itemized deduction, not the standard deduction of 13,850. If they got married, uh, then then I would get a standard deduction of 27,700. And if nothing changed on my itemized schedule, I would still want to be taking the, the standard deduction. So note that that standard deduction is quite high. So in, unless you're paying a pretty substantial amount of interest and have other itemized deductions and having property taxes, the 
the benefit that you get from buying a home just for tax deduction purposes is more complex than just, well, I get to deduct the whole thing versus I don't. The question is how far away are you from being able to, to itemize, you know, and what's going to be the actual impact on your taxes, not just this year, but for multiple years into the future, if you, if you then uh, are able to itemize by buying a home, for example, but, but then you have to pay the loan payments, the interest, you know, is interest, right? It's basically rent that you're paying <laughs> for the money that you purchased, right? So anyway, so then we got, so that's gonna, let's make it back to here. So we're back to here. So I simplified it back and we got rid of the, of that one. And there's going to be our taxable uh, income. So that then the bottom part of page one is basically our income statement, which I can double check and verify most easily with just my Excel worksheet in a formula basis. The tax calculation, as we said, was gonna be more complex. If I go to page two, then the tax calculation happens here. Oftentimes we're not gonna recalculate it. We could in our Excel worksheet, just to kind of double check that the calculation makes sense to us. But oftentimes we might allow the software to do that and just basically kind of see their calculation if it makes sense, basically, uh, which again, it'll be a lot more complex if I had other types of income that are not ordinary income, such as qualified dividends, capital gains, for example. So then if I close that out, that's gonna give us our tax calculation. So we're saying, all right, tax has been calculated, but we wouldn't yet be done because we could have credits and other taxes. Now, the, 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 the credits that come into play, there's a wide variety of credits, but some of the most common credits are the child tax credit and possibly like an earned income credit amongst many other credits. And we'll get into those later. Uh, but just note that there's gonna be an above, you know, like a, a, a credits that are, are non-refundable. Those are the ones up top and credits that are gonna be refundable that are gonna be down here with the payments. And the ones that the portion of the credits or the credits that are up top are ones that cannot bring your tax liability below zero. The credits that are down below may bring them below zero. So let's just add the most common credit. Let's add like a, a dependent over here. So we'll say we got a dependent. Let's change the, the filing status because we're gonna say, okay, they're gonna be, he's gonna be head of household now because oftentimes when you have a dependent, it'll pull it up to the head of household and then we'll add a dependent and this is gonna be Sam Taxman. And so we're gonna say born, let's say 0120, uh, uh, 20, let's say, <laughs> and hopefully that works. And then they didn't, they haven't died yet. So, okay, which is a blessing. We're happy for that, even though Mr. Sam Taxman can be quite uh, a burden, some tr quite troublesome sometimes, but that's okay. We still love them. And so there's that. So then if I, if I go on over here, we could say, okay, so now Adam has moved up from single to head of household, and now we've got uh, Sam Taxman, and there's a child tax credit. So what were the impacts? Well, now we changed the filing status. So now the standard deduction has moved up from 13,850 to the head of household, 20,008, 79,200 taxable income. And then on page two, we've got the child tax credit at the 2000. So you can see the 2000, you can go into here and take a look at the worksheet for it. We'll focus in on that later. And, and that's an above, notice it's above up here in part because the tax, because, because we still had taxes, right? We still had taxes that was owed. So this didn't take our tax liability below zero. But if I was to say, what if taxmen didn't earn as much money? And I said, what if he only earned $20,000? Then if I go back on over, you could see the income is now at 20,000 and the deduction is 28,000. That means taxable income is at zero because that can't go below zero. So it's not a negative 800, it's zero. And then over here, there's no tax because he doesn't have any taxable income, but we still have an earned income. We'll talk about this later, but these are the refundable portion. I'm just trying to point out the difference between the refundable credits down here 
which still could impact and give you a quote refund, which isn't really a refund because this is more of like a, a, a safety net program, a welfare type of program, right? That's in the tax code because you're not actually paying taxes for the, the year 2023. If these are in play, you are, you are uh, receiving uh, benefits, right? You're, in that case. So that's it's part of the safety net program. Okay, so that's going to be the taxes. Okay, I mean, that's going to be the credits. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Let's get rid of the dependent. Get rid of the dependent. You're out of here, Sam. Get out. We're had enough of you. No, we just he's 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 no longer dependent. He's on his own now. He's married and gone for good riddance. I'm just kidding. Uh, let's see. So then let's say, uh, let's say that we had wages back up to 100,000. And then, and okay, so now we're back to the norm 100,000 single. Now he's head of household, let's bring head of household back to single, single. And so now single uh, 100,000, 13,850 standard deduction, taxable income, 86,150 going to page two, then we could have other taxes that, that could apply here. Now, one of the big ones on the other taxes would be the uh, Schedule C with self-employment tax, for example, and that's on line 23. So let's just take a look at that one. Now, this just note, if you're a tax preparer, look how much this complicates your return if you have to deal with self-employment tax. So let's imagine that doesn't have W-2 income, it's gone, but instead 100,000 from a Schedule C. So we're gonna say, now I have to deal with a Schedule C, which means you're gonna to have to deal with accounting because now I'm not gonna populate the entire Schedule C here. I'm just gonna give the general information, but let's say that they, they had income of uh, 110,000 and then expenses, I'm just gonna put 10,000. So it nets out to 100,000. Uh, so first you have to deal with the accounting. That's a problem because you know a lot of people aren't as good at just basically breaking out their books for their business. But you, so you have to deal with that. And then if I go back on over, you can say, okay, not a big deal. I got a schedule C, it's just an income statement. So I'm not gonna look at the whole thing. I'm just giving, just giving a, a quick look at, okay, 110,000 minus the 10,000 here, that makes sense. So that gives us 100,000. They earned 100,000, just like with the W-2 income. If I go into the to the 1040 and look at it, I'm gonna say, okay, so there's the 100,000 that is being uh, pulled in. It's coming from Schedule 1. So the Schedule C pulled into the Schedule 1, which flowed into here, and that flowed down to here, and that flowed into the Form 1040. So there it is. That's cool. That makes sense. But then what is this? Adjustment to income. I didn't have any adjust. I got rid of the adjustment uh, to income. Well, what happened if I go to schedule one and go to page number two? Now you've got this deduction for part of the self-employment tax. Like, well, that's nice. But what is this self-employment tax? I don't like the looks of that. And so we can go into the self-employment uh, tax calculation. And basically, this is this is the IRS saying, I know we have an income tax on the form 1040. However, we also want to collect in essence payroll tax. You know, in other words, social security and Medicare from you. And we feel like even though even if you don't have any employees, you are your own employee and therefore you need to be paying into social security and Medicare. They'll try to say it's a good thing too because they're then you get to pay into the system and you're going to get some benefits out of it. But obviously you'd rather keep your money most likely because the social security system is pretty much bankrupt at this point and I, I don't have any faith in it but uh that's what they want and they want not only the employee portion but the employee and employer portion in essence so this becomes a huge possible tax that you would have to pay of the 14 129 you can see that pulls over to the 1040 page number two so there's that added tax so here's basically kind of like the income tax then kind of like your payroll taxes for self-employed businesses or whoever's subject to self-employment tax, which is kind of like the equivalent of payroll tax, Social Security, Medicare. So then that will have a significant you know, impact on 
on the tax calculation as well as your projections. Now then what happened to this? You get half of it over here that you get to what happened there. Why is that? Well, if, if they're trying to mirror as if you're your own employee, even though you didn't give yourself a W-2 income and you're the business owner and so on, then normally what would happen is there would be an employee and employer portion of the payroll taxes for Social Security and Medicare for an employee. So you have to pay kind of both of that. But then normally the business, if it was a Schedule C business, gets to deduct the employer portion of the tax. We'll talk more about that later. And so you should get to deduct it too, but you can't deduct it on the Schedule C because you had to use the Schedule C to figure out what the net income was to calculate the tax in the first place and that would create a circle reference. So you have to deduct it somewhere else. And so that's why it's an above the line uh, deduction here on, on the Schedule 1, which pulls into the Form 1040 so you see it having an impact there, which reduces the adjusted gross income to 92,935. And then, and then you have the standard deduction still applicable. And then you've got this whole business with the qualified business income deduction, which is on another form, which again, you would only have that form feeding in here if it was uh, applicable, right? And, you can, and that's a whole nother uh, worm can, can of worms. It's a, it's a can with worms in it. And it's kind of, so, <laughs> so we might touch on that later. And then, and then, and then you've, you basically get down to the taxable income and then you're on page number two and so on and so forth. So I'm not, so we'll get into the schedule C later. I just want to point out that they, there's significant impacts, not just on terms of the bookkeeping, but also in terms of the impacts on the actual form. And then it, you do get into tax planning issues uh, and so on uh, with with even just a basic kind of sole proprietorship Schedule C, especially if they have employees and whatnot and you want to give like a retirement plan and, and that kind of stuff. So it, it, it actually expands the complexity a lot. So again, as a sole proprietor or as a tax preparer, if you are a tax preparer, you want to think how complex do I want to take on more complex businesses uh, of a Schedule C nature or possibly you work with other people and say, I'm, I'm going to do the data input for the taxes. I'm not going to do the bookkeeping. I'm not going to do the schedule S's or the S corporations, the partnerships, uh, the LLCs. If there's another return, I'll take the K1 and put it into the 1040. And then I'm going to focus my time on more basic individual income tax returns. That might be one strategy, or you might be quite competent with this kind of stuff. That's your thing. That's your wheelhouse. You might be an accountant, you like the bookkeeping. Well, then you can do the bookkeeping uh, with it and, 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 and again, get into uh, certain areas. And even in that case, you might wanna choose industries and see if you can kind of specialize uh, by industry because oftentimes industries have particular needs. In any case, we'll talk more about that later. And then you also have the taxes uh, that, or the payments that were made. So now we have the payments down here. So we're down here at the bottom of the formula so the payments have been made during the year, the most basic payments being with the W-2 if you had W-2 income. So let's go back to a basic return. Let's say, okay, let's get rid of the Schedule C. That's scary stuff right there. I don't know, we'll talk more about that later. We're starting, you're jumping into the deep end on that one and it's cold water. I'd be okay with the deep end if, it, if, uh, if you picked like warmer water, but so then, so let's go and say that we have 100,000 and then possibly you had payments that were made during the year, let's say of uh, 12,000. And so then if I go back on over, now we're back to, if I go to page one, the 100,000, 13,850 standard deduction, 86,150 for the taxable income, page two, tax calculated 14,266. And then we're saying that we paid 12,000 with withholdings. Now, again, our goal is to pay enough so that we cover the taxes, not because we just like refunds, but because if we don't, we get hit with penalties, right? So the, the system here is trying to calculate the possible penalties uh, that we would have. And, and this is just an estimate, right, this, of, of possible penalties that you can have. That's what we're trying to avoid by paying equal to or over the tax that were owed or trying to be in line with some safe harbor regulations based on prior year tax returns 
to avoid paying taxes. Otherwise, it would usually be the smart move to save up enough money to pay the taxes at tax time, but not sooner so that you can hold on to your money longer. Right. But the government, the government doesn't want to do that. They want to have your employer take the money from you before you even touch it because the government has lost all faith in, <laughs> in, in the taxpayer giving them, giving, them, uh, their, giving them their money. That's how the voluntary tax system works. It's an involuntary, voluntary tax. Anyway, so we got the 12,000 minus, I mean, the 14,266 minus the 12,000, and then we get to the amount uh, you owe. Now, if we had, we could have withholdings from 1099s. If it was a Schedule C business, then we might be making estimated tax payments. So again, this payments line item is a lot more complex than just one line because there's multiple different ways that payments can happen. So that's the general concept. And then the refund or the amount that is due, if you owe money, you have to, you know, you could think about a payment. If you have a refund, the question is, do you want to apply that refund to the following year as an estimated payment or take the refund at this point in time? So the general concept is we're visualizing something that's fairly basic here, but you can see that each of these line items are expanded and there could be a, a lot of questions and details about each of those line items. And then whenever a tax question comes up, we're, we might think about the particular line item being impacted by the question. Think about the impact on that particular group, that line item, and then what the possible ripple effects are for the rest of the tax return if that line item changes based on the income tax formula.